Hey, hey, welcome to the Bullpen Sessions podcast, a podcast for driven insurance professionals who are looking to reach their full potential in their insurance careers. This is the place where we help motivated insurance professionals build the right mindset and tools to create more credibility with their target prospects. I'm your host, Andy Neary, former professional athlete turned insurance advisor. Each week, you will learn tips and strategies to help you execute a clear prospecting game plan every single week. Clarity creates action. When you're clear, you're confident. When you're confident, you're consistent. When you're consistent, you are unstoppable. All right. Let's dive into today's episode. Hey, hey, welcome back to Bullpen Sessions. My name is Andy Neary, and this is episode 282. Today, I am excited to have John Hansbro join me on Bullpen Sessions. John is a risk management consultant with AccraSure out of Los Angeles. John has had a lot of good success as a young advisor, and I wanted to have John on the show to talk about what he has done to excel his insurance career. He is a former college football player, great athlete. By the way, he has an amazing story of how he met his wife on the football field. It is an unexpected story. You're going to absolutely love it. But in this episode, we dive into the lessons John learned playing college football and how he has applied those lessons to his insurance career and how he is using social media content to create awareness with his prospects as well as advice he provides when you are trying to sell innovative solutions in a market that has been historically very traditional. He is in Los Angeles, a market full of HMOs, carriers, and the traditional fully insured market. So he has got some great advice if you find yourself in a very similar situation. So tune in to today's episode. John has got a lot of energy. You're going to love his vibe. I can't wait for you to meet him and learn a lot about what he's doing today to have a ton of success in the insurance business. All right, here we go. John Hansboro with AccraSure, my friend. Welcome to Bullpen Sessions. Hey, Andy, how are you doing? Good, man. I'm excited to have you on. Um, we're going to be talking about a really good topic, I think, today for those that are tuning in, especially if you're an employer in a market that you are in, like California. How do you help employers think outside the box when they find themselves in a market where traditional insurance products have been sold historically? So I think that's going to be a fun conversation. But before we get there, we're going to use this as an opportunity for people to let people to get to know you. How does that sound? That sounds good. Yeah. Let's do it. So you are a health insurance advisor today, but there was a time you weren't. Where were you born and raised? Yeah. So I was born and raised in San Diego. And so I was there until, uh, I was there all through uh, high school actually. So I got to enjoy that. That was pretty, uh, pretty nice to grow up with. And unfortunately it kind of set the bar pretty high. <laughs> so I'm curious, how did it growing up in San Diego? Now you're in LA today. Uh, mm -hmm. what led you to live, uh, moving to LA as an, was it, was it college? Yeah, it was going to school. So, okay. so when I came out of school, when I came out of high school, I was looking to go to college, um, mostly looking at like small liberal arts schools to play sports. Okay. And so I was a football baseball guy. So I had, I had designs that I was going to go play baseball and football somewhere. Um, I looked at some schools on the East coast and that sounded great. I went out in the summer, it looked beautiful. And then I went in February to Maine and I was with the football team and we were trudging through snow to make 6am lifts and that just was not going to happen. So um, I came back from that trip and was pretty dead set that, you know what, maybe I should just move 90 minutes north to Los Angeles and take advantage of that. Plus also realizing just from an overall networking standpoint too, if I go to school in Maine, I'm probably going to end up in Maine long term or somewhere on the East coast. And that just wasn't going to be for me. So what, uh, what, out, co what college were you looking at in Maine? California. Colby, Middlebury, all those schools. I got into Colby. Uh, one of our coaches in high school, he had played at Colby. So he was able to plug me in there and I was really close. I was really thinking about it. I really liked the coaches there. Um, I honestly probably liked the coach for baseball there more than I liked the coach uh, at baseball where I went to at Occidental. Um, and I just, it was tough, but I think for me, just staying closer to home was nice. And it worked out. I ended up playing football all four years at Occidental. And I think I did the math one time. I think my mom made it to like, what was it? Like 32 of my 36 games wow. over the course of those four years. And that just wasn't going to be possible on the East Coast. You know, like I took two flights out there to get there. And it just was like, you know what? My mom can drive up and back to a football game in the same day if I go to school in L.A. 
let's do that. That makes more sense. I won't lie to you, man. When you told me you went and looked at colleges in New England, I was like, are you just trying to get away from your parents? Like, look at the map. San Diego to Maine no. is literally the farthest away you could go in the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was the influence of that coach, that coach uh, okay. back in my high school in San Diego. Like, he was a really good guy. I really saw a lot of myself in him, and I still have a good connection with him now today, um, staying in touch with him in the football team and baseball teams. And I, I was really leaning. I was really thinking about it. But in retrospect, it made no sense. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what's interesting, John? I was just having a conversation with some friends about this, you know, with the Pac-12 dissolving, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to become part of the Big Ten. A lot of people are so focused on the football uh, aspect of that. But what I don't think a lot of people are taking into account is how all the other sports are affected. Because the thing I brought up being a baseball guy, I'm like, okay, so if the Pac-12 teams are going to be part of the Big Ten now, how mm -hmm. are you going to convince a kid to come to UCLA who's used to playing baseball in SoCal all year. And now you're going to say, Oh, by the way, you're going to have to go to Lansing, Michigan in April for a game. Right. Yeah. That's not going to be as appealing in recruiting. Yeah. It's tough, but I think, I think it's an overall shift for a lot of those student athletes anyways, that it's like, yeah, it's a business. It always has been, you know, and that's why, you know, like, yeah, for baseball, though, it's tough. I think for some of those sports where for baseball, you've got a multi-day trip, for some of these schools. So, you know, again, like if you're going somewhere local, you can make it happen. Even if you're just yeah. going up and down the coast and staying in the same, same time zone. But if you're a baseball team and you got to get out to, yeah, like Midwest, you got to go a couple time zones over and you've got a Friday game and then you got a doubleheader Saturday and then you're coming home. That's tough. That's Not only that, great. you're used to playing, you're used to playing in 60, 70, 80 degree weather. And now it could be gray yeah. and 45 degrees. Yeah. It, it's, it's a big shift. So, okay, so you played football at Occidental. Did you play baseball there too or just football? I thought I was going to, and then the sometime over the summer as I was about to matriculate and getting ready for football season, the baseball coach left or got fired. I can't really remember. And, you know, as a college athlete, like when the coach who recruits you leaves, that's a huge change. Um, it's D3, so it's not like I had a scholarship or anything like that. Um, but still, I had a relationship with that guy. And the person who came in was just polar opposite. And so I was wiped out. For me, I was wiped out from football season at the end of that. I didn't really spend a lot of time over winter break getting ready for baseball season. And and just the times that I spent around that coach, I just wanted nothing to do with him. And so I ended up just not playing. And that was tough because in some ways, I'm probably a better baseball player than football player. And so not doing that was hard. But Part of it was that I had a really good time on the football team. We went undefeated my freshman year. That was a total community, like a total family. And I just wanted to be a part of that because, you know, in college sports, you're busy. It's basically a job. And so I saw the off season as a time to really spend more time with my friends that I've been making and not just being in the locker room and on the field. And that did bear out. I did have a lot of fun with those people and, and enjoyed that bonding. Cause it would have been weird bouncing around between social circles, you know, in the fall I'd be with football spring. I'd be with baseball. That would have been really hard to manage from a social standpoint. Oh, I, I could have, and not, not just that managing school and everything else. Right. I, being yeah. a oh, yeah, school. an athlete in college is, is a, is a, uh, a clinic in time management. Yeah. And, and it you definitely know, affected it. Like I didn't have as good of grades probably as I would have had if I had just done school. Um, yeah notwithstanding whether there would have been like other distractions and stuff like that, but it was fun. It made my experience richer. Um, I think you learn a ton of lessons from that. And like, there's just a huge gulf between people who played sports and didn't play sports, especially those in college. I'm in a networking group specifically for people who played college or professional sports. And it's a different kind of people. It's a different kind of person who's in a group like that because you're the ones who are waking up early, you're dealing with shit, you're going through it and you've just got a determination to do things that is not always the case in the general population. It's a different way of going about stuff and carrying yourself. It's a little exhausting sometimes. They're not always going to be the people I want to spend all my time around, but I do have a lot of things in common with them that I just don't share with people who didn't do that. And I know you understand that. kind of. We talk about stuff. it all the time here uh, with Complete Game Consulting. You've worked with us before and we could... If we really wanted to, we could niche within the insurance industry to those people who are former college pro athletes, because a lot of yeah. our clients fall into that category. And I think a common denominator to those folks are drive and discipline. And yeah. 
when I work with somebody who played a sport at a very high level, here's what I know about them. I don't need you to, I don't need to tell you to work out. You just need to work out. I don't need you to tell, I don't need to tell you to go watch game film. You just need to know what to look for. And that's really what separates a lot of those former high level athletes is they're so disciplined sometimes to a fault, Mm -hmm. but they just need a plan so they can go run with it. They don't need to be coaxed into why they're doing it. And, and I think that, I think you're spot on. And, you know, you brought up something about school when I was playing baseball at UW Milwaukee, same thing. I was actually, I started my undergrad in architecture Mm -hmm. and I'll never forget you go into your sophomore year in architecture. You have to start studio, which is a four hour class twice a week. Oh my God. And it was cutting into my fall practice and I would have to leave, uh, the studio halfway through to go to fall practice. And the, the, my, uh, professor in the studio finally said, you got to make a choice. Like you can't be missing two hours of studio twice a week. I said, I'm here on a baseball scholarship though. And the next day I became a business major because I'm like, I'm here to play baseball too. And I can't give that up either. So I understand the balance between sports and and academics is often overlooked, but it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. it is. And I, I had some friends who went to D1, D2, and they had to make that tough choice and change majors. Um, one friend in particular at a D2 school actually quit the sport because he was saying, dude, I like this sport, but at the same time, I did come here to get an education. He was at a really good school. He needed to be able to spend time getting that degree and earning that and not just chasing the sport. you know. And I think we see that. I mean, like, we're not going to go down the rabbit hole, but for me from – from a college sports stand or from a, from a where sports are at right now standpoint, man, some people I know they're just chasing playing time, moving all over the country, playing at two or three different schools over the course of four or five years. And like, I wanted to go to school in a major metropolitan area, get a good education and then be teed up to go work afterwards. You know, going again, some more snaps or some more playing time in just all over the country is not going to really lend a, uh, lend a hand to that you know that didn't really make sense to me um so but I, it seems like right now people are chasing playing time and bouncing even high school you see these high school kids that are changing schools like so easily and i uh, wonder what that does for them socially not only are they chasing playing time i'm gonna say something that some people might not want to hear because maybe they have a kid in this category yeah there are too many kids who are trying to play at a level they're not capable of i see a lot of kids going d1 who should not go d1 and i was just down in Florida last week watching my nephew play college baseball. He's D3 at UW Stevens Point here in Wisconsin. And he probably could have gone higher if he had been seen earlier. But you know what? As a freshman, he has started from day one. He's where he should be. And he's getting playing time right away. I see a lot of kids want to play at the big time level under the bright lights and they sit the bench for four years. Yeah. What's the point of that? You know, What's and it was point? interesting. My, my school did. A, so I went to Occidental and the coaches there, they had a really interesting recruiting ability to go pull kids either down level. So we, for example, brought a guy down from Oregon who was a safety there where he wanted to play quarterback and they tried to move him to safety. And he said, screw you guys. I remember this small little school in L.A. He bounced down to uh, Occidental. And when you do that, especially back then, you didn't lose playing time or eligibility. Right. If you go up a division, you lose eligibility. Down a division, for some reason, you didn't. So he moved to Occidental, played quarterback there, never lost a regular season game in three years, and he was a legend. Um, other times, like that just, to me, made more sense. Go somewhere, be part of the culture. But, oh, man, you're just going to struggle at some of these bigger schools. And I, I do wonder how much it was driven by the parents, right? I think a lot of parents, they want to say course. their kid got into a school or that they of got into playing D1 sports. And it's like, yeah. Did the kid enjoy it? They're their own person. What it's also why kids are, it's also why kids are burnt out before they end up finishing high school. Yeah. And we're seeing that. We're seeing injuries. Like when I hear about injuries right now, especially from high school players, they're injuries that you would think you'd see in like a late college player, you know, just the tendon issues and all the stuff because their bodies just aren't built to play a sport all year round at 100%. 16, 17 when they haven't developed the right way yet. So what was your position in baseball? So baseball, um, I'm a golden retriever, like put me in the outfield and I'm going to go chase every single thing down. Um, I've got a great arm. So I would, you know, love that. I would run around. Um, I literally ran through fences <laughs> a few times. Um, uh, there's still video up from an alumni baseball game that I went back to and I ran through the fence on the play. 
Um, and I still play softball to this day. So uh, it's kind of one of my favorite things go run around, catch balls, throw balls. Um, I pitched a little bit, uh, but I just never figured out the biomechanics. I'm a big guy and I just couldn't get speed on the ball. I just didn't have the right mechanics, I think, for it. Uh, but that was fun. Um, so, and that was something I did honestly, like baseball for me was my, my first love of sports. Cause that was something I did with my dad growing up. And so I was that kid. I remember waiting for my dad to get home from work. We had a bucket of balls and a bat and a glove. And as soon as you get home from work, we change, go down to the field and play until it was so dark. You wouldn't know if you were standing under a fly ball or not. So it started getting kind of dangerous. Um, you started guessing. So was, exactly. Yeah. So for me, that was baseball. Like was my first yeah. love of that. And just, having that memory of going out. What was your position on the football field? So football in high school, I played receiver and tight end and outside linebacker and D end, um, small school. And, and is what's funny now. when I go back to the high school that, that Colby coach actually, that I'm still friends with back there. He's the head coach down there. Now we laugh about the fact when I left high school, I had the receptions record in a season. It was like 40 catches or something. And that was in, the 2000s and nowadays they have multiple kids with 80 catches or more every season yeah so <laughs> games changed I a little bit because i would have loved playing in a spread offense like they have now instead in our case we just ran the ball i think 30 or 40 times a game uh, but then when i got to college i just played defense i played outside linebacker and i think this is like one of those lessons you learn from sports that is applicable elsewhere is i wanted to get playing time i did everything i could to be in great shape and my sophomore year, we had a bunch of injuries at safety. And my defensive coordinator looked at me and said, can you backpedal? And I said, I can learn. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course I uh, can. I, I learned how to backpedal very um, average at best probably. But I was fast and I, could, I liked running downhill and hitting people really hard. I was pretty good at that. So I started playing some safety. And, and frankly, at a small school, this is, again, where you kind of just pay attention to the dynamics where you're at is – we don't have packages. We don't have enough players to have a nickel or dime defense where you run different people on for different um, personnel groupings coming in on offense. So for me, being able to play outside linebacker and safety, I just conceptually knew where everyone was supposed to be on the field for every play. And you have to know that for those two different positions, right? And so then I was able to be down on the line and and really, you know, hammering the line, playing the tight end, control, you know, controlling the edge and, and containing, you know, outside plays is is if we were playing like more of a tight end heavy, run heavy team. And then other times we played that spread offense where they were throwing the ball a lot, I would play back middle safety and we'd run that cover three. And so I could bounce around between the two. And that gave us a lot of flexibility that I think you kind of internally realize, okay, learn multiple positions, learn the big picture. So then I'm trying to get playing time, like make it so hard that they can't not play you. Was well, I, and really I, I think the less, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised being uh, that you ended up being a safety because you played in the outfield, right? I, mm -hmm. I always look at safety as kind of the center fielder of the defense. And I think because of your skill in the outfield in baseball, I'm not surprised you ended up playing some safety in college football because you were probably very good at it. Just like reading everything going on on a baseball field, it's the same thing in a football field, probably moving a little faster with bigger athletes, but it's the same concept. Yeah. yeah the first, the first time I got into a real like live competitive game in college, I remember they ran a screenplay and I was coming up field and there were some offensive tackles coming to hit me. And I realized, Oh shit. Okay. This is college football, not high school football. <laughs> so and it's, you know, it, everyone thinks, Oh, D three is not that serious. There's some, studs in d3 there's good and, football yeah, we, we've good. got whitewater right down the road from us here they went to seven or eight yeah. national titles in a row with mount union d3 football is no joke yeah and yeah these dudes were coming out to hit me and i was thinking okay like all right let's go this is this is college football not high school anymore yeah so um yeah it was a good experience i'm so happy i did it it was hard as hell say, and i had a lot what would you say you know doing knowing what you do now you're in the benefits uh employee benefits world if you think about how you how you apply drive and discipline today into your business, what would you say college? How, how has college football impacted what you do today? You have to recognize the system. I think is one thing. So you have to understand, for, at least for me, playing defense was like understand the big picture and where you fit in, because you need to know that everything's covered, and you might not be responsible for everything, and you really can't. Right? Our, our college college football or really football in general is known for the coaches having great sayings. Mm -hmm. And our college coach definitely had stuff like that. He said, don't screw the guy next to you. You know, if you see them out of position, let them figure it out, but don't abandon your position 
to go fix someone else's problem. Mm. You still need to recognize it and you still kind of need to, you know, you need to know the big picture, but you need to take care of your own stuff first. Um, he used it with more colorful language than that, <laughs> but that was the first thing was probably definitely understanding systems and all that. The other was just get shit done. So understand you've got an objective and go just take care of stuff. Don't worry about all the other things going on. Don't worry about attribution and, and all the stuff that to me has never made sense. Like the bureaucratic power games, it never made sense to me because it was just, hey, let's like go make it happen. If you need to do this to, you know, you need to do this to go win the game. Um, that was a big one. Well, if I could I just, I'm going I'm yeah. to mention something there. I want everybody to hear what you said. Playing within the system. Some people might not be able to understand how that ties into being an insurance advisor, but it's a huge piece because you're you're mm -hmm. still playing within a system. You're with Acrisure, right? It's a big team, big organization, and you've got to know who's on that team, what system are you in. But to your point, you got to let the other people do their job. And I think there's a lot of people who want to be viewed as the hero when it comes to what we do, and they end up yeah. doing everything for everybody else. And what they're not realizing is their their focus on trying to be seen as an innovative advisor or whatever it might be is hurting the system because they're not letting other people do their job. Yeah. And that's like anything with sports, right? You know, if we play a team and I'm crushing the tight end and I'm containing that edge and our middle linebacker gets like 15 tackles, he gets 15 tackles and everyone thinks he's a stud, but it's because he's defending like a 30 yard wide field, not a 52 yard wide field. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that I think something that I definitely recognize with athletes is that athletes can depersonalize things in a way that I think sometimes people just don't develop that muscle, essentially. Yeah. And I always remember a couple seasons, our coaches had to stand on the sideline and say, hey, right now you're John, you're a brother, you're a son, maybe you're a boyfriend, whatever it is, like you've got these identities off the field. If you mess something up on the field, and again, Football coach is more colorful language. If you mess something up on the field, I'm not yelling at you, the boyfriend, the son, the brother. I'm yelling at you as number 16 on the field. You didn't do your job and you screwed the guy next to you. You screwed the team. That's who I'm yelling at. And that was really hard at the time. It wasn't like it came natural too. Like it doesn't come natural because most people don't act like that. But you learn as an athlete, and especially in college where the stakes are feel higher, right? It's, there's There's a greater intensity to it can't take that stuff personally. So if I do something wrong or we come off a call and I use some language or I wasn't maybe presenting in the right way and my, and my boss calls me up afterwards and we talk about that and we break it down almost like film, he's talking to me not as the husband, right? Not as the friend. He's not talking to me in a personal mean way. He's talking, hey, you're a broker consultant. You want to either service this group well or potentially convince this group to move over to us that's your objective you got and you did something that didn't get towards that objective. Let's break it down and fix that. So the next time you come up in that situation, that doesn't happen and you're better. Right. That was a huge, that was probably the biggest lesson I probably learned from college football in a lot of ways. Well, what he's saying in, in a roundabout way is your results are not who you are. If you absolutely yeah. sucked today on the football field, it doesn't mean you're a bad boyfriend. It doesn't mean you're a bad human or a bad son it has nothing mm -hmm. to do with who you are off the field. You just suck today as a football player. Yeah, And I think a lot of people need to hear that because it is easy for people to tie their results to their value. And I, I've been guilty of that, man. I mean, if, if, if things are going well, I feel well, I feel validated, but at the same time, if business is slow or whatever, all of a sudden I feel like I am not worth it. It has nothing to do with who I am as a person. It just means yeah. guess what? Business is slow. No big deal. Yeah. So and I, I had to be therapy true. about that. Like I'm pretty forward about that. Like I've done therapy about this, having to work on separating my what I do for other people with my own self-worth because I think that's such a thing of like hey if I'm not getting playing time I'm not starting like in college I I was pretty depressed my junior year I was competing for a starting position with my buddy and he ended up beating me out for it and I was looking at it and I was saying hey I've spent three off seasons I've already played two full seasons and I'm not getting the playing time I really want to have right now and we weren't having a successful season. So I was yeah. really frustrated from that. In retrospect, I probably should have been doing therapy with someone at the time. And I just wasn't. But I was depressed as hell from that. Because but think I about the not. lesson learned there, man. How, yeah. how hard have you worked on a new account as a benefits advisor and come in second place? Yeah. And you're like, what? I worked my butt off as hard as 
lesson in sports. You could work your tail off as hard as anybody else on the field, on the practice field. Doesn't mean you're going to be the starter. Right. Hey, hey, quick announcement. If you are an insurance professional looking to optimize the way you prospect and generate leads and you find yourself intrigued by LinkedIn, but just don't know where to start, I want to talk to you about the Social Media Sales Academy. Listen, the idea of diving into the social media and putting yourself out there can be daunting and the fear of presenting your best self online is real. But let's face it, the traditional methods of prospecting are failing you and it is time for a change. Who is the Social Media Sales Academy for? If you are a driven insurance professional looking to grow your revenue but strapped for time, you're looking for a more efficient way to prospect and you are just watching others have success on the platform and you want to have the same success, I want to talk to you. Over six weeks, you are going to learn directly from me the ins and outs of LinkedIn using our proprietary playbook, the LinkedIn Diamond Playbook. By joining the Academy, you are going to learn how to create a prospect-friendly LinkedIn profile, how to find your ideal prospects and send connection requests that actually get accepted. You're going to learn how to post content that engages and attracts your ideal prospect. You'll learn how to show up on video with confidence. And you're going to learn how to send direct messages that turn connections into sales conversations. If this sounds like something you know you need to do, I want you to go to completegameconsulting.com backslash academy. That is completegameconsulting.com backslash academy. You'll jump on a call with us, see if it's a fit for you, and we'll get you enrolled. The next class starts on May 1st. I hope to talk to you soon. And so I, I, those, there are so many lessons, man, you can learn from sports. We could talk another hour about that if we wanted to. I do want to, I do want you to share a cool story and we're going to dive into the professional side of things. Yeah. You told me offline. So you play, you still play flag football today. Yep. I play flag football all the time. I had five games. And there are very few people I have met that have told me, uh, I met my wife on the flag football field. So in my head, I'm going, wait, okay. So your, your wife plays flag football. And mm -hmm. then you said she's a stud. You got it. You got to share this story. How in the heck does um does somebody meet their wife on the flag football field? Yeah. So I was mid twenties, like the really like truncated version of this is I was in my mid twenties. I had just been lifting after playing football in school, and I was like, I need to do something competitive and meet people and whatnot. And I was walking on the beach in Santa Monica, um, which is I know just like so tough. And there were people playing flag football on the beach. And I thought, this is perfect. And like, you know, I'm tan. I'm from San Diego. I played college football. This is to go shirtless. Yeah, it, it just paints the yeah. whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like all time team skins. And so I just started playing. I met up with them and that was just a meetup. And so I was playing weekly with them just on the beach. And eventually uh, a couple people invited me to go play and sub on a grass league. That was co-ed. And I got plugged in there and uh, had just started playing with them for years. Then around 2018, um, I was playing on a weeknight and we were playing a team and uh, the team was really bad. We were crushing them and the quarterback hit this girl in the flats and I was driving on her and she threw a move on me and wiggled her way into the end zone. And I thought, wow, OK, like. I'm pretty good. And that was, you know, that was a good move. I didn't just miss that. She she made me, you know, she earned that. And so that was the first time she kind of caught my eye. And then we just ended up running into each other a couple other times. Uh, once we started dating, I unfortunately have run into her literally on the field a couple times. Um, so that we played each other a few times and I have creamed her twice. So uh, that is a thing that we're kind of known for. And, but no, and, you're married be, to, and you're married today. I know it, it did not make her call off the wedding. Um, the joke that we've actually had is that her fingers are so jammed up from from playing football and basketball, actually, that it was actually tricky doing the wedding ring. But yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing for us. And, and you know, at our wedding, our officiant, we only know because of flag football. And multiple groomsmen on my side were people I met from playing flag football. And we had like 40, 45 people at the wedding that are just a community we know from flag football. That's and cool. so I always try to explain that to people. If you're lonely, if yeah. you're looking for your people, get involved in a hobby, get involved in a sport. Because like, yeah, it's about football. But it's also a group of people I see on a weekly basis, sometimes yep. multiple times a week. I've got yep. connections with and we're talking about something. And, you know, there's a whole adage, especially on the men's mental health side of do things shoulder to shoulder. Yep. 
And so when we're talking about defense or we're talking about breaking this down, or we're talking about how we're going to go attack a defense that is bonding time with other guys, especially that I get that's really helpful. But then also just, I've got this huge network of, of female friends that I have now too, from sports. That's really helpful in a lot of ways because you need different kinds of relationships in your life. And so we've got this huge family now that's just been awesome. You know, uh, I actually love this because, you know, when people want to know, how did you meet your wife or what, what kind of move did she make on you at first? People are going to think like, did you meet at a bar? Did you meet? No, she yeah. literally made a move on you in the middle of the football field, made you look bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she <laughs> actually made a move on me. Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of hard to tell, but in my background, we've got a bunch of medals from our co-ed sports leagues. And the joke people always have is when they come over, they're like 90% of them are hers. Of course. Uh, so she's she's a beast. She's a beast. There you go. I love it. I love it. So let's talk. Let's talk a little business, man. Before we wrap this thing up, um, mm-hmm. you're in a market, California, where you know it, it, it's a it's a mostly fully insured market, right? There's a lot of traditional products still sold out there. Very HMO heavy. Very carrier specific heavy. Yep. A couple things I'd love for you to talk about because you've had some good success at Acrisure. You know, you've gone through our programs. One thing I've watched you do, and I'm very, it's, it's, I, I've admired your consistency is um, you decided to start using LinkedIn content and mainly LinkedIn newsletters. And mm-hmm. you've done a phenomenal job with staying consistent by putting out a, a newsletter out on LinkedIn. What was your thought process behind that? One, committing to the process of, of using content as a possible lead generator but then how have you seen it impact your business at all, if if you have? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's impacted my business, not in necessarily the ways I probably would have guessed early on. But that's partially why you do this stuff. Is just, and it's, I, I come back to the sports. I feel like I'm just a broken record, right? But it's like, you know, don't get hung up on trying to find the perfect workout before you go to the gym. Go to the gym, start working out, find what you like, find out what works for you and keep iterating on it. You know, you got to iterate, just keep, keep building, keep iterating and make changes as you see, as you see necessary. And so for me, I started my career insurance on life insurance and I was in my twenties trying to sell life insurance and I'm a broke guy in his twenties. All my friends are broke people in their twenties and, you know, a high cost of living area. No one's buying life insurance. And so I really struggled with that because I couldn't, I didn't have a repeatable way of finding leads and getting myself out into the market and differentiating. Um, I got lucky enough that a few early clients asked me if I could do health insurance and I figured, well, I need to get paid somehow. Let me figure this out. So I ended up plugging in a little bit there, got into the benefit space. And that was where I realized, okay, this is on a repeatable cycle, right? There's the 12 month benefits renewal cycle. So that means there's always some kind of schedule in which someone needs to talk about stuff. Whether or not they're going to take a call with you is obviously up in the air, but it's at least a reason you can go talk to someone on a regular basis. That was a key thing. And then is what I realized is I can differentiate in various ways here that made more sense as a young guy, frankly, than on the life insurance side. Because I was always going to struggle there when there's the dynamics of that space. So when it came to benefits, I think the thing for me is starting to do content is that trying to think really strategically about who the audience is, what kind of message they're looking for, how you're you're thinking about how is someone going to hear about me and why are they going to start wanting to talk to me, right? And it's, a, it's, it's something that I kind of struggled with early on in the process because I would kind of almost get frustrated, right? I kind of thought if I become a subject matter expert, if I know all this stuff, people are just going to beg to work with me. Yeah, they're going right? to, if I build it, they will walk in. It. You know, and I, early in my career, like I would spend, you know, I'd print stuff off and I'd read things on the weekend and I would try to become this just expert and just this nerd. And that didn't translate to doing business because business is, it's all about, you know, it's, you go back to baseball, right? Um, you want to hit 50 home runs in a season. Well, you need more than 50 at bats. You got to do the numbers backwards, right? And learning about some of that marketing stuff, I think at first I I was hesitant and struggled with because I thought, dude, I got into this business not to do digital marketing and know all these things. I got in to help people. But then you kind of make the connection. You realize, hey, to help people, I got to do this stuff. I got to get out there, get in front of them and educate. And I think a big thing for me was connecting marketing with education. That was something that really appealed to me because I just I don't want to sell. I sometimes got shit um, from from 
coworkers. I mean, it happened last week where this guy got on a call with us after referring us and he said, you didn't go for the kill. And yeah, I'm not good about that. Like I want to educate so much that it makes yeah. so much sense to work with me. We don't even almost have to talk about it. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the right way to go about it. But that was something I got even in, in sports, right? I, you know, I talked about playing college football, but my coach in college said, dude, you're too damn nice. Hmm. You're too damn nice. Like, and that was something that I've really struggled with because in a lot of ways growing up, I was always complimented on that. Yeah. I was always told I was nice. And I thought, yeah. oh, that's a really good quality to have. Uh, but one of my early mentors in, in, in the insurance space, she did tell me this job is going to whatever – skeletons you have in the closet whatever issues you have that you think you're covering up this industry is going to pull it out of you because it's a really hmm. demanding one it's a very tough one you're going to have to confront that stuff head on or else it's going to cause issues for you long term or prevent you from ever having success at all and so when i realized that i needed to focus on education within my marketing that was a big tectonic shift in a lot of ways not really because i necessarily knew what to do because I knew now what to look for in terms of how to educate myself to then turn around and educate people and, and create a funnel that made the most sense. Right. And probably coincidentally around that time, I probably gotten saw some of your content and that really was speaking to me in a way that, you know, leadership at our company still would say, Hey, you know, call people, cold call, go try to find an angle in, make it a product sale, whatever it might be. And that's just not the way, like when I've, when I've sold cases, like it, a lot of times, especially in the mid to upper markets, it's a lot of education. It's a lot of showing that you either have a process for finding the right answer, not necessarily that you know the right answer, but that you have a process for finding the right answer and helping them find the best answer possible, but that you're willing to also go look for it, that you're educatable, right? Whatever the term would be like, you will go learn things and go find them and bring them back to them and develop that process, that relationship. Because I always want to feel like I'm sitting on the same side of the table as a prospect, not that we're sitting across from each other, having this back and forth and hammering a negotiation out. That's not my style. And, and frankly, it's a, it's a thing I look for kind of psychologically within the, within a meeting when I'm with a prospect is how do I show them that I'm actually sitting on the same side of the table as them? And we're looking at this problem in front of us. It's almost like we're architects. You talked about architecture. We want to get an outcome here. We want a building that's safe, that's aesthetically appealing, and that it accomplishes some kind of function, right? And I'm not hammering them. I'm not trying to sell them. I'm trying to show them that we've got the best education program or the best way of finding those answers possible and a quality relationship that they can know, like, and trust me as well. So that was yeah. a big shift for me when it came to the, to the marketing side of things. Well, and I, th I, th I found int what, what I found interesting is you said, dude, I don't want to create content. I don't want to, you know, because I don't want to have to educate people, but that's exactly why you should create content. Yeah. Right. Why would I want to do this? Like, I, I want to be educating people. Well, that's exactly why you should be creating content. It allows you to educate yeah. people. And yeah. like I said, you've done a phenomenal job staying consistent with it. I remember getting a text from you. I think it was in the fall sometime, maybe. And I just remember, uh -huh. I hope I hope I had it right. You said something like, dude, the pipeline's insane right now. And I think that's a lot to do with the fact you've created a ton of awareness, man. Ha ha has the content mm -hmm. instantly led to AORs? No, it hasn't. But it has built a lot of awareness for who you are, your company. And now I think you're starting to see the benefits of that awareness that you have created. Yeah. And part of it is the internal dynamics for us. I'm almost as much marketing internally as I am externally. Yeah. If that makes sense. So, yeah. so like we just are, you know, we're working on a case right now that was brought to us from some commercial producers in our company who they've got a specific way of going about and doing business. They're big in alternative financing. And we speak that language. We have a lot of the same philosophy. I'm sharing our philosophy on things that appeal to them significantly because we have hundreds of employee benefits producers in the, in the across the country. Yep. They chose to work with us because we've been developing a relationship. We've been getting to know them in a personal flesh to flesh kind of arena. But on top of that, they see the stuff we're putting out there and the way we're talking about things. And they know that there's some alignment from a philosophy standpoint, yep. because that's so often the case now, right? You go out, like I'm reading a book right now. It's all about customer experience. Like at the end of the day, our customers have the reins in a way that they did not maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They, are not just looking for the person who can do the job, but the person they want to continue working with and trust and, and, and find credibility within. 
So that was a really big thing for me is that realizing, hey, as much as I'm talking to like the ultimate buyers in, in yeah. client companies potentially, it's also industry partners. It's my networking kind of circles who just have an understanding of what we care about, not just what we do, but what we care about and why we care about it. What advice, you know, I'm curious, you're, in also, you're also in a market that has been traditional, right? There's a lot of HMOs, a lot of, you know, the vast majority of that market's fully insured. Um, and you guys are trying to do some outside the box, some innovative things in that market. What, what's your advice to somebody who might be listening in, who is, finds themselves in a similar market where they, they feel like they're pushing a boulder uphill because you are that one person trying to do something different. And it, there's going to be days you feel like nobody's listening. Yeah. What advice would you give that? Because I know you've been you've been somebody who has been very consistent about trying to do different things for employers in the LA market. What advice would you give another advisor that is struggling with that same uphill battle of nobody nobody seems to want to do anything different in this market? Yeah, I think it's tough. I think one of the things that I've had to really come around on is recognizing that you can preach and have a certain philosophy, but you can't only do that, right? Mm -hmm. So so we have a lot of groups where we talk about, say, self-funding and alternative mm -hmm. risk models and using captives or whatever it might be, just taking on some risk and, and being comfortable with some variability in their costs. And groups say, that's cool. We're not going to do that just yet. And you know what? Don't, don't bypass, you know, don't, it's hard to even say that it's like that saying of like, you know, stepping over pennies to pick up dollars, but go pick up some BORs, work with groups and build out a multi-year plan of potentially getting there by building on things. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of groups, I think that's the dynamic that we run into. We have a lot of groups that they don't even know anything about self-funding. So I got a call from a producer in another state within Accrature. He is a client here in LA. And he was asking me about the market just to get an understanding of things. And I said, what's your usual playbook? What are you usually doing? And he was talking about level funding. And I told him, I said, this group probably has no idea what level funding is. They've probably never heard of this. They have never heard of stop loss insurance. And he was bewildered. And I'm telling him, dude, I've got groups with hundreds of employees who don't want anything to do with self-funding because usually to a lot of groups, that's something that they're not familiar with. And so this is where we have to pay attention and do the psychology, right? Is I've had dynamics at times where I talk about something, I get too excited about it. And then I realize I'm kind of showing up my potential client at a company in front of their boss because they don't know what this is. I need to make them look like the superstar. And it's the stuff that you and I have talked about at times that you talk about a lot, which is you're not the hero of the journey. As much as I'm a Star Wars geek, I've got some Star Wars stuff right here. I'm not Luke Skywalker. Go be Yoda. Be Yoda, be Obi Wan, make them look like the superstar, and give them the potential for the the points. Essentially, right? Is yeah. that was a huge shift that I've had to learn because at times I've done that where I've showed up prospects because the market here just doesn't know about this stuff. And you so, said something though. I tell I tell more producers, John, that are in those markets, similar markets. You have too many producers right now who are trying to be innovative outside the box, but that desire to be outside the box is actually what's costing them business. And yes. what you said that I don't want people to overlook is when you are in a market like that, where it's hard to get people to shift because you're in a market that has been more traditional. What is that easy step one they can take to mm -hmm. start working with you so you can then shift them to where you want them to go over time, which by the way, they may never get to, but yeah. stop, trying to do so much so fast that they have no desire to make that shift with you. You got to yep. make step one easy. And I've run, I've run into that. I've got, we've got another producer that I've talked to all the time and she's run into that where if you come in too hot talking about say self-funding, they could throw that out immediately. And it's, it's the same thing. Like you're coming in and selling a product. If they don't like the product, they're out. And it's more of the strategy. It's the yep. strategy of saying, Hey, at the end of the day, What's this person's journey they're on? They're trying to cut costs. They're trying to retain a team. They're trying to go out and recruit. It's yeah. one of those three things, most likely. Yeah. They're dealing with the fact that they've got, you know, I talked to groups and they've got uh, great candidates who get to their second, third interviews and the benefits question comes up. And that's part of the reason they end up not taking an offer. Yeah. Well, they don't care about self-funding. They care about offering better benefits. Talk about it in that way. And, you know, you can probably make some benefits enhancements and stuff early on, but then also just build a long-term plan. 
but you don't talk yourself out of the sale or the conversation too early. Yeah. I love that. Last question, man, then we'll wrap this up. Yeah. You still are, I'd say you're still fairly young in your career here. Um, but you've had a lot of success early on. If you could go back and talk to yourself that first year you were in the insurance industry, what advice would you give the younger version of you knowing what you know now? Man, it'd probably be really patient. It'd probably be be more patient and find the best possible mentor you can mm. and just learn everything possible for them. I've got a great mentor and he's made a huge tectonic shift in my career. Awesome. And like, I wouldn't be here today without him, you know? Yeah. And I think that's a huge issue in our industry is the way that we recruit in is not conducive to, I think, retaining and building a deep bench, yeah. right? We bring people in and they got to go sell business immediately or they're out. And it's why we retain like 10 to 20% of people after three to five years, right? The statistics are terrible. And part of that is this model of come in and sell or else you're out. And That's so awesome. for me, I needed to find a mentor, get more of a, like a producer team. And, you know, it's interesting if you're, you know, you talk to other industries, I've got friends in say commercial real estate, and sometimes that's their model. But a lot of times the ones that I know that are crushing it, it's because they met someone who had a pipeline, but they needed help managing it. And they joined a producer team. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's tough. Like right now I'm looking at a case where we are, there's, you know, splits going left and right. But we're selling the case and that's okay. That's good. It's just something that I think early on I wish I'd done more of is try to find a team and be part of a team. That's probably the Don't biggest thing I would have recommended to myself is, you know what, like 50 or 25% of a bunch of business is way better than 100% of zero. No business. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I see it percent. all the time. I see a lot of advisors who don't want to go in on collaborations for the sake of giving up revenue. But to your point, it's you're, you're, you're going after a hundred percent of nothing because you refuse to, to partake in 50% of something. Yeah. And you know, it's yeah. funny. I'm a big, I like Robert green a lot. I don't know if I'd say I'm a big Robert green fan. Cause I think you could almost sound like a sociopath for that. Um, I love the guy though. I've gotten to meet him. He's a cool dude, but that's a big thing he talks about. And I think it's mastery is like, you got to find someone that you apprentice under. Yeah. You got to find someone you apprentice under cause you don't know enough early on. Yeah. And you'll know that it's time to move on when you're sitting in meeting after meeting and you're going, I wouldn't say it that way. I wouldn't have done it that way. They're missing yeah. this. They're missing that. And there's times that that happens for me now. And I think that's an interesting yeah. shift I've noticed in the last few years is I'm putting the pieces together and you're learning so much more than just the X's and O's, right? It's, it's a lot more of managing the personalities, managing the conversation. Yeah that you just aren't going to, you're not going to read in a textbook. That just takes the reps. It takes the reps and sales. Yeah. Well, John, this has been fantastic, man. Um, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, what, what's the easiest way to get in touch with you? Yeah, probably LinkedIn. Um, I do have a Twitter. I'm trying to use a little bit more for work, but LinkedIn is probably the most accessible way. Um, so LinkedIn, Twitter, pop me an awesome. email at act for sure, whatever it might be. I, I want everybody to take to heart what you, what you talked about today. This was phenomenal. Not only yeah, business business insights, do. but sports insights, things you've learned on the football field. Guys, number one, you have to use content today to grow your business. Awareness is so important. Not only is it valuable to your prospects, but the way you said, John, it's valuable to your own team. It's valuable inside your own organization to help understand where you're coming from and what you're doing. You talked about seeking mentors. You talked about playing within the system of the team right? This is all a pa important parts of being a successful insurance advisor. You can't go it alone. And I would rather give up business right now, give up comp to win business than be so egotistical that I wanted to keep it for myself. So I'm staring at an empty pipeline with no business. And John, you've had a lot of success early on. And I think it shows because of the work ethic you've taken from playing football almost being a dual sport athlete in college and applying it to insurance. And I think that's pretty impressive to watch, man. That consistency of you showing up week after week, I get to see it on LinkedIn, but that consistency I know is paying off for you, man. So keep it up. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. And you've contributed a ton to that. Just the content you've put out going through your program. Um, that's exactly like, it was just one of those funny things where the universe aligns, right? 
I think yes. when I came across your program, it was like the right perfect time where I was thinking, this is exactly what I need. Yeah. But and when I went did through it, it, I was like, that's exactly what I needed. It. You took it and you modeled it. And that's what's important. It's one thing to learn it, but it's another thing to execute it. And that's what you have done well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. For everybody listening in, I, I, the reason I have advisors on like John and others is because these are the folks who are executing right now in the industry. And my goal for you is to create some clarity because when you're clear, you're more confident. When you're more confident, you are consistent. And when you are consistent, that's when you become unstoppable in this business. So I hope you take what you learned from John today, apply it in your business, model John, go follow him on LinkedIn, doing do what he's doing. And I promise it's going to lead to business growth. Be good. That's all we got for today's episode of the Bullpen Sessions podcast. One thing that would really help us both and other new potential listeners is for you to rate this show and leave a comment in iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you tune in to listen to the show. Also, make sure to link up with us at CompleteGameConsulting.com on social media, and please share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. Until next time, remember, clarity creates confidence, confidence creates consistency, consistency makes you unstoppable.